This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Well, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of When Science Speaks. Today's episode is brought to you by Bayer Strategic Consulting in Washington, D.C., which helps scientists and engineers get funding, gain influence, and build relationships with the stakeholders who matter most. It is such a great pleasure to have Steve Dickman on the show today. Steve is the founder, CEO of CBT Advisors, which is a life sciences consulting firm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Steve worked as a full-time biomedical writer at Nature and The Economist before becoming a venture capitalist with TVM Capital. There, his deals included SEMA Therapeutics, sold to Merck in 2006 for over a billion dollars, and gen Genetics Pharmaceuticals, which was later renamed Bluebird Bio for those who are keeping score at home. And that IPO'd on NASDAQ in 2013 and reached a $2.8 billion valuation in 2015. In Steve's current practice, he applies sharp analytical skills and deep industry experience in crafting business deals, telling persuasive, impactful stories, understanding the VC and investing world, and carrying out industry analyses on behalf of clients. Steve and his team work with biotechnology, diagnostics, and health IT firms. Steve has blogged at Forbes and Boston Biotech Watch. He earned his bachelor's in biochemistry from Princeton University. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure. Now, as an accomplished science journalist at Nature, you know, you founded and you ran the first Nature News Bureau in Germany, for example, among other leadership responsibilities that you had. And then you were a freelance writer for Science Magazine, which of course is owned by AAAS. You know, what led you from there into the ecosystem of VCs, private equity, and startups? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I'll try, try to uh, weave in a few anecdotes to, to answer it. So mm -hmm. I just want to say, first of all, I realize your audience is comprised of a diverse group of current scientists and engineers, people who are already working somehow in an entrepreneurial capacity, and then people who may already fully be on the business side and are just trying to keep up with trends and insights into how the industry works. And so I'll, I'll try in my answers to really capture the different worlds that I've worked in and that your audience is working in. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, I'm going to uh, begin my, my response to your question, how did I make this unusual leap from the journalism world into pr venture capital and private equity uh, by mentioning a third publication that I wrote for, uh, in addition to Nature, where, as you said, I founded and ran the Munich Bureau, and I wrote several hundred stories for the front of Nature, not the scientific part of Nature, but the front part, the news uh, part of the magazine, and um, science. I wrote for science as a freelance contributor for several years, but there's a third publication that I contributed to and that really shaped me and that really also launched me into my career transition, and that was The Economist. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I had, I got the opportunity, I became an independent writer, uh, a nicer term for freelance writer, in 1991, after about four and a half years on staff at Nature, I was still stationed in Munich, I had not moved back to the United States at that point, and I met an economist journalist at a scientific conference, and his first question for me was, Steve, why aren't you writing for us? <laughs> and I was a bit surprised because to me, The Economist was and is the pinnacle of the journalism, the English speaking journalism world. I mean, it is to me um, one of the premier publications in the world and certainly one that I read and respected at the time. So I said to him, Oliver, I just didn't realize that was an option. <laughs> uh, and, you know, starting to see the world through the lens of the writers and the editors at The Economist, of course, it was a, a big revelation to me. I mean, I was going to say The Economist staffers are anonymous. And it's something most people who love journalism, even lovers of journalism, aren't aware that there were a bunch of news magazines in the 60s and 70s, including Time and Newsweek, as well as The Economist, that mm -hmm. kept their writers anonymous. There were no bylines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But 
American culture, marketing culture, self-promotion conspired to convert all of the American publications into bylined publications. Whereas there is really only one way to get a byline in The Economist, which is to be selected to contribute one of the 10 to 20 page special sections that they occasionally right. run, in which case you get named. And my editors informed me that, yes, that would be an option for me too, although it was typically staffers who got those assignments, but that you had to kill someone to get one. <laughs> That's a high price to pay. So being an anonymous writer for The Economist, where it really gave me complete carte blanche to write about anything I wanted in the world of innovation, and you mentioned I was working on biomedical innovation. I mean, I kind of was, but I was also writing about innovation in general. Mm -hmm. My work at Nature also was more broad than just biomed. Uh, but given that incredible free range and the anonymity of contributing to a publication that would take all the responsibility for the piece, like take all the heat in some mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, I really, I quickly came to realize that the stories that I had been writing for nature and the ones that I was still writing at the time for science, while often very impactful, they didn't have to have quite the same broad appeal as the ones that The Economist was expecting me to contribute. That is, as a, an economist contributor, I was now looking for stories that were going to have an impact on the broader society, on the business world, mm -hmm. on the financial world. Mm -hmm. And it was actually a story like that that I had sourced while I was still at Nature and that Nature had unusually rejected out of my 400 stories. I probably had two rejected. And this was one that was rejected that became mm -hmm. later my first story for The Economist about the application of the principles of evolution, Darwinian evolution, mm -hmm. in the laboratory to basically achieve therapeutic or agricultural goals. Mm -hmm. And that piece on unnatural selection, as it were, it became a story in The Economist. It became a magazine feature in a big German monthly magazine, Geo, sort of like the U.S. National Geographic. Mm -hmm. That story had real legs, and Nature, my original employer, just had, they told me they had no interest in a story that was anywhere outside of the narrow boundaries of science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as I stopped thinking about the world through those narrow, through that narrowing lens, as it were, it really opened my eyes to the fact that the most interesting stories, as stories, were actually the biomedical or other innovations that were bound to have a big economic impact, a big environmental or societal impact mm -hmm. that just writing about the latest transcription factor or even about the latest big concept of transcription factors for a wider audience, which is what I had kind of been doing for nature and science, mm -hmm. that was no longer so satisfying to me. Mm -hmm. And so it occurred to me also because as a journalist, I was earning a really rock bottom amount of money. Um, it occurred to me that my skill set and my avid interest in innovation could also be satisfied with a different kind of career. Mm -hmm. And so now to answer your question, you know, having been sensitized by my writing for The Economist and having been made aware that I really couldn't afford a home of my own, let alone a family, on right. what I was earning as an independent writer, I always made a living, which most writers told me was remarkable. They couldn't make a living as an independent writer. I made a living, but it wasn't much of a living. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me as I was writing a story, this is now about 23 years ago, about the launch of a biotech industry in Germany, mm -hmm. which never had one, which in some way still doesn't have one, although there are a few exceptional companies, including one that's making a COVID vaccine, mm -hmm. uh, that have come to be in the intervening 23 years. But by and large, and despite my efforts, later efforts as a venture capitalist, not very much came of these uh, government efforts and later financial industry efforts to cultivate biotech in Germany. The fact that they were trying, though, was very interesting. And that was definitely worth a story. And so when I got a tip from a friend that the German government was trying to, see, trying to seed the biotech industry in Germany by really bolstering early stage investing in Germany, investing mm -hmm. alongside venture capitalists, whatever, I immediately started calling people who I already knew, German top scientists and thinkers 
And the first person I called was Axel Ulrich. And his name is not a household word, but the company that he worked for, the first one that he worked for, really is a household world word because he was one of the first five people at Genentech. Ah. So Axel, you can tell from his name, he's German by birth, had been recruited to a lab in San Francisco in the mid 70s to work for Howard Goodman. And Axel and another German postdoc, Peter Seberg, were essentially plucked out of their laboratory, academic laboratory jobs and deposited in what was going to be Genentech. They were really there with Bob Swanson, the venture capitalist, and her boyer, the scientist turned entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. really almost from day one. And so Axel had an unusual perspective on science and biotech. He never stopped being an academic scientist, and he was running a lab in Germany when I knew him uh, during my days as the correspondent. But when I started thinking about Germany starting a biotech industry, immediately I called him and I said, hey, Axel, what do you think about this idea of Germany starting a biotech industry? And he was completely unvarnished and very open. And the first thing he said to me, which was the quote that led off my story for science uh, in uh, that year in in, uh, 1997, he said, "Huh, they are running after a train here in Germany that has already left the station. Uh, uh Uh-huh. And I said, that's interesting. Can you tell me more? And he had some opinions. And I wound up interviewing 18 people for that story, 16 mm-hmm. of whom I already knew uh-huh. uh, because they were German academics. And those had been my essentially daily contacts when I was the correspondent a few years earlier. Mm-hmm. And so it made me realize that there was going to be an entrepreneurial and financial effort in biotech in a place, Germany, that I knew very well, mm-hmm. and that it was one plane ride away from where I was living at the time, which is and was and still is Boston. So Oxel said to me, by the time I got off the phone with him in our second interview, he said, by the way, Steve, do you know how to write a business plan? <laughs> and I knew enough not to say, what's a business plan? But I did want to be honest with him. And so I honestly responded, no, Axel, I don't know how to write a business plan, but I can learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a couple of months later, there was a course offered at MIT. I had spent some time as a writer in residence at MIT. Mm -hmm. And I still read the course catalog. And there was a course being offered on the nuts and bolts of writing a business plan for a startup. Mm -hmm. So I took the course. And of course, MIT at the time, I mean, the the doors were open. I mean, if you had the course catalog, you could find the course, find the building it was in and just show up and you could take the course. They weren't taking attendance. Mm -hmm. This was a a January term course, so it wasn't a formal course. So I showed up and I took the most copious notes of anybody in that lecture hall. Because, of course, I had the motivation that I wanted to call Oxel back and say, hey, guess what? Now I can write a business plan. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that really was my entree because I was sitting in Oxel's lab a couple of months later and working on the business plan for what would become his third startup. First one was Genentech. You know the history there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one was called Sugen, and that was sold for $600 million, I think, um, to uh, – U.S. pharmaceutical company uh, in around 1999. Mm -hmm. And then this one, you know, this is, you know, basically uh, uh, a a third company that he wanted to think about um, setting up um, where I got to write the business plan. And I was sitting in his lab one day working on this business plan and the phone rang. And the lab people came in and were to the desk where I was sitting and they said, Steve, it's for you. And I said, uh, I don't know how, how, I don't know how it could be for me. I, nobody knows I'm here. And you know, like, how do they get this number? Right. Well, it was the top, it was one of the two top life science venture capitalists in Germany on the phone. Mm-hmm. And he had heard about my efforts from Oxel. Uh-huh. And he said, so, um, Hey, uh, Steve, I hear you're working for Oxel writing a business plan. I said, yeah, exactly. He said, well, that's very interesting. How'd you like to come over to my office and, you know, talk about that? I'd, I'd love to learn more about your work. And I said, well, that's very nice, but I've got an awful lot of work to do on this business plan. And I don't think I can do that. I've got to sit here and work. And so I blew him off. And he didn't like that. I mean, 
it motivated him, let's put it that way, yeah. uh-huh. to reconnect and say, well, oh, if you can't meet me while you're here in Munich, how about if I meet you in Boston sometime? Axel told me you live in Boston. And I said, yeah, that would be much better. I should be done with this by then. So that turned out to be the person who welcomed me into his venture fund. It was mm-hmm. Helmut Schusler, who, uh, who was at the time the managing partner for the life sciences practice mm-hmm. at TBM Capital that mm-hmm. you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was my entree. I got to meet Helmut, but I didn't necessarily want the job. And what really was was motivating me, like why would I turn down what sounds like a dream job in venture capital, whatever? Well, I had two reasons. One is that I didn't know, I didn't feel like I knew the area well enough. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was still early in my learning mm-hmm. curve, on mm-hmm. even how to write a business plan, given that right. Oxels was my very first one, right. but, but also on how the whole financial world worked. Mm-hmm. So, the other reason that I wasn't jumping at the chance to accept an offer to work for, for Helmut in his practice, his venture practice, is that he wanted me to move back to Munich. <laughs> and I wasn't ready to do it. I had already started my life here in Boston, and I didn't really want to move. So I said, how about this? We met. We had a pleasant time with each other. I was convinced that he had skills that I definitely didn't have, a vision and a, sort of a big picture uh, vision and great storytelling skills. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I said, hey, how about this? How about if I stay here? And how about we collaborate kind of in, indirectly? And I do some projects for you. I do some projects in your portfolio. And we get to know each other better. And also the companies can maybe get some benefit from that. And mm-hmm. I can get some experience so that when you come back to me, I will have a lot more under my belt in terms of how biotech works. Mm -hmm. He said, that's a great idea. I'll hire you. I'll get some other companies in my portfolio Mm -hmm. to reach out to you. And Mm -hmm. why don't you write some business plans and we'll just stay in touch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was a really good start. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Let me ask you something, Steve, that you alluded to. I love those. I love that story. I think it's going to be really illustrative for listeners. And I want to ask you something specific because mm-hmm. you've alluded to the fact that you were really new in the industry. Um, and uh, that was, you know, something you were very open and transparent about. One of the things that affects a lot of academics and, and a lot of my listeners are, are interested in is imposter syndrome. Um, you know, and I've talked to biotech folks, you know, as you know, uh, quite a bit. And a lot of times as they're entering biotech without significant either whether it's subject industry experience or if they're in finance without a lot of biotech finance experience you know they they experience they they feel this you know very uncomfortable feeling they're surrounded by experts in the area and they're themselves not an expert and in some ways they're they're looked to to be to provide you know expertise Mm -hmm. and so um you know that's i'd love you to for you to talk a little bit more about how you dealt with that i mean it sounds like you were very clear in the beginning about sort of where you were at that point but of course you were learning you were you know, by experience, experiential learning plus the course you took. But I would love for you to address that, uh, that kind of feeling, that imposter syndrome feeling. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned it, Mark. Um, I only first heard this term a few days ago, mm-hmm. but you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I, I didn't know what it was called, but I definitely had it. Mm-hmm. And I actually was thinking about this today, about what it was that, you know, sort of, uh, characterize the challenge that I faced in going from being a reporter and working independently. I mean, even as a correspondent for Nature, you know, my boss was several hundred miles away across the English Channel. Um, and I really had a lot of independence. And so it really, it was, I mean, Nature was my first job. It was my entire professional career, as such as it was, you know, 10, 12 years at that point that had basically been lived as an independent thinker and writer and contributor. Mm -hmm. Uh, And now I was being asked to work in a team. There was a hierarchy. It was not a very steep hierarchy. There were really basically two levels. There were the the partners and then there was everyone below them. Mm -hmm. It was just two levels. So I was transitioning into a hierarchy, no longer being independent. And I was also asked to, as you said, be an expert on certain things expert on U.S. biotech to the European partners in the fund, (laughs) expert on biotech to the IT partners, and expert on what actually 
is going to make the fund money. It really does come down to that. What's going to make us money, long-term or short-term? A lot of times there are some twists and turns in that. You don't know, you know, on day one necessarily, will this make me money? But on the other hand, if you don't have a pretty good idea that it's going to make you money, you shouldn't be spending time on it. Mm, right, right. So I thought about this. What was it that, you know, made me feel more like an imposter? And what were the things that made me more sort of ready for this transition? And I would say the toughest part for me it started with that, that um, topic of confidentiality, that as a reporter, anything confidential was either off limits to me, categorically off limits, or it was being revealed cloak and dagger in a way that would lead to a scoop. Mm -hmm. Well, once I got into venture, everything in some way was confidential. That is, Every company that came to give us a presentation, it was really not in their interest for us to talk about that with anyone else. We typically wouldn't sign confidentiality agreements. Venture capitalists typically shy away from doing that, although sometimes we did and sometimes VCs do. But whether or not we signed anything, it was so obvious that we were not to really broadcast what it was that we were hearing from the companies coming to pitch us. And by the same token, even more so for the portfolio companies. We had to be really strict about maintaining the um, maintaining the integrity of the intellectual property and business secrets of the companies we had invested in. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we had to talk about it with our friends at cocktail parties. We had to attract other venture capitalists to invest in these portfolio mm -hmm. companies. We had to talk about them with our limited partners. And on the other hand, we had to keep quiet. <laughs> and as you can imagine, I mean, for somebody as a reporter who was used to just basically having this stuff be in the public domain, mm -hmm. period, mm -hmm. or not be accessible at all, mm -hmm. right? it was a huge transition to, well, what does confidential mean? And what does it mean in this circumstance? And well, who can I actually talk about this with? That was, I would say that was a couple of years right there mm -hmm. of a learning curve. Right. Um, another thing which I think made me I won't say it made me an imposter at the beginning, but it definitely made me uncomfortable was the meaning of relationships. Because don't get me wrong, as a reporter, it was only by having solid and I would say um, good human relationships on a basis of mutual trust, mutual respect, mm -hmm. that I got any stories at all. Right. You know, the stories would not, I would not regurgitate press releases as a reporter. I would always have to interpret what the institutions or individuals were broadcasting that week in order to come up with an angle that would lead to a story that would be interesting for a reader to read. And as soon as it was angled, then of course, I was no longer completely parroting what my sources were telling me. I was really playing the sources off against each other and standing outside of everyone. And that skill set of being able to do that, it turned out to be very valuable in venture capital. But what I couldn't quite fathom at the beginning, again, what took me a long time to realize was there were certain people in the universe of the top venture capitalists whose word was just accepted full stop. Mm -hmm. And those people could be managing partners at other funds. They could be leading scientific experts, they could be government officials, or limited partners, investors in the funds themselves. Certain people's word carried so much more significance. And where I had been taught as a reporter, and as a student before that, to question basically everything and everyone, mm -hmm. here I was being asked to just accept that certain things just had to be true. Mm -hmm. And I was very dubious about that. I mean, it was, I would say, a big evolution for me to begin to parse what I could just accept, as I was being told to, versus where I could actually get away with questioning and then where I would be rewarded for questioning right, the, right. The, the, the sort of import of what someone was saying. I mean, I can give an example if you like. Sure, that would be really helpful. So my first year in, I mean, my, my boss, the same managing partner who I had said I was too busy to meet when I was sitting in Oxford's lab, mm -hmm. um, he told me the day that I started, um, he, he basically called me and said, okay, in three days, you're getting on a plane, you're going to fly to Germany, we're going to keep you here for a week and a half, and by the way, uh, I'm going to throw you into cold water. 
I said, oh, uh, you know, thank you, sir. <laughs> that sounds interesting. And one of the ways in which he threw me into cold water, I was the greenest, youngest in some sense, not necessarily chronologically youngest, but least experienced mm -hmm. member of that team. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he did was he said, hey, um, a good friend with whom I've already made a lot of money. So, okay, one of these people whose word you basically just had to accept. Mm -hmm. He said, my good friend who's a managing partner in another fund, a fund named after his good friend because his friend was such a senior guy, he had his own fund with his own name on it. Mm -hmm. He said, my friend has invited me to invest in a deal with him and I want you to do the due diligence on it. <laughs> yeah. So on the one hand, what a great opportunity. You know, there was, I would say, a lot of pressure on me to find reasons to do this deal. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, having been trained as a reporter and being in my mid-30s and not so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed anymore, but really kind of skeptical about mm -hmm. the way things really are, I said, fine, you want me to do diligence on this? Do you want me to just rubber stamp it or do you want me to do diligence? He said, no, 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 I do the diligence. We're, we're interested in how this comes out. So this company was in St. Louis. The company was doing imaging. It had a new device to do real-time, high-resolution imaging of, for example, the interior of the chambers of a patient's heart. Mm -hmm. And it was a technology that was very welcome to the so-called electrocardiology field because those cardiologists were constantly using pulses of electricity to deaden certain pieces of tissue inside the heart, pieces of tissue that were responsible for sending spurious electric signals to the rest of the heart and causing atrial fibrillation among other maladies. Mm -hmm. So essentially the, the, the game was to stop heart attacks by ablating or deadening a few selected, very carefully chosen and mapped pieces of heart anatomy. Mm -hmm. And clearly a technology that could basically illuminate what, what this uh, interior of the heart looked like in real time in collaboration with digital x-rays and give the surgeon essentially a joystick that he could use to actually point the ablation tool to exactly the right spot. Mm -hmm. This was going to be super in demand. So there was definitely a value proposition. It was definitely a real company. It had a real CEO and a bunch of intellectual property, and it passed all those checks. Mm -hmm. In order to do the diligence, I flew to St. Louis along with a prominent electrophysiologist, cardiologist from the Boston area, a guy who at the time was with St. Elizabeth's Hospital, later went on to Mass General. Mm -hmm. And so Ken and I flew to St. Louis together. He almost missed the plane. I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> no, you may, never mind the, the, the technology. Yeah. You yeah. Had, almost oh had my God. Heart he was the last person on that flight to St. Um, Louis. I was uh, still relieved. <laughs> we went to this company and they gave us the whole dog and pony show. Mm -hmm. And Ken was blown away. He was blown away. And he was so impressed that he wrote me a 30 page report on how great it was. Mm -hmm. And I read the report, it was well written, and it was incredibly optimistic and positive about why I should invest in this company because it had this cutting edge technology, so to speak, and it would really revolutionize heart surgery, you know, cardiological intervention in, in you know, heart attack. And I read the whole 30 pages and I called him up and I said, Ken, uh, just one more question. He said, sure, anything. You, you know, you saw I love this, right? I said, oh, Ken, it's very clear your report is 100% positive and I will use it as such. I said, I just have one question for you. He said, yeah, anything. I said, you didn't say if St. Elizabeth's will buy one when it goes on the market. Will you buy one? And immediately I could hear his, his tone collapse. <laughs> And he said, oh, well, you know, they cost a million dollars. Mm. I said, yeah, I know. He said, the capital budget here, it's constrained for the next five years. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could get a million dollar budget item approved for at least five years. Mm -hmm. I said, thanks, that's all I need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I rejected the deal on that basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's where I really had to figure out, A, am I going to get fired for this? 
<laughs> right? Because I was going against somebody who you just had to believe. Right, investor. right, right, right. B, is my boss going to be so mad at me that even if he doesn't fire me, he never gives me another assignment again? Yeah. Like purgatory, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And C, am I really missing something here? Like, am I going to miss out? Right. And, you know, thank God. I mean, the boss was peeved, but he wasn't furious. Mm -hmm. He was just irked that he couldn't invest with his friend. And the deal, yes, the company did go public, but it didn't do very well. Mm -hmm. And the venture capitalist who did the deal basically never did another deal. Wow. I mean, his career more or less ended with that deal. Maybe there was one more. His fund ran out of money. And, you know, I'm not saying that the deal drove his career to, into the ground. What mm -hmm. I am saying is it was a good thing I didn't do it. Yep. Yep. That's the bottom line. So interesting. And I almost feel like your training as a journalist, which at that point had been kind of hardwired into probably your thought process or maybe your thought process kind of, you know, a little bit of a little bit of self-selection to go into the field to begin with. But um, that is such a practical question. Um, it's, it's almost like, and fundamental. Um, and, you know, just cutting directly to the most important thing, you know. Uh, well, directly, I mean, I had done weeks of diligence at that point, and I had paid Ken and another expert a bunch of money to do right. this work. So right. it was really kind of the concluding piece of diligence to call up Ken and say, well, mm -hmm. capital equipment, how's your, you know, how's your appetite now that it's a capital equipment item? Um, I did want to throw out one more thing, Mark. Sure. Um, clothing. <laughs> You have to have the right clothing as you make yes. that change. Yeah. Yes. From yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, yeah. seriously. I mean, uh -huh. I, you know, you asked me about imposter syndrome and I said I had it without realizing that's what it was called. Mm -hmm. I was there doing my thing, you know, flying to St. Louis and meeting people like Ken and, you know, fending off the boss and his daily whim. And um, I, I had the opportunity to have a conversation with a much suaver, more sophisticated member of our team. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, you know, because I felt trust, I trusted him and I felt like I could get a straight answer out mm -hmm. of him. Unlike a lot of people I met in venture capital, I'm not talking about my fund in particular, but just in venture capital in mm -hmm. general, it's not necessarily the most trustworthy bunch. Mm -hmm. But this guy, I felt like I had really, I had established a rapport with him. He was a doctor. He was only a venture capitalist for fewer months than I had been. And I said to him, listen, uh, I just have to ask you, like, you see what I'm doing here day to day, like you have a little perspective, you go to the same meetings I do. What do you think? Is there something I could be doing better? Mm -hmm. And he said, Steve, I can't think of anything that you could be doing better, but I will tell you one thing. And, I, and he said, you know, and I said, what's that? And he said, just get yourself some better clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Dude, thank you. Like, I didn't realize that the tweed jacket that I'd been wearing since I was a, you know, a venture, a, a, a reporter for a British publication, right. that really, I, let's put it this way. I went straight to Hugo Boss and I bought uh -huh. a black wardrobe and then everything was good. Everything was fine right after that. I just love it. You know, so my next, my next question, uh, first of all, you've told some great stories and you know, a lot of times scientists and engineers, other technical people are told that they need to think about stories and think about storytelling. And you've given some very specific, uh, great stories. Uh, and I want to ask you sort of pulling it up a level of detail, because you're an expert in developing and delivering persuasive, impactful, impactful stories. What makes a story persuasive and impactful? Okay. I think it's a great question, and uh, you'll see in part of my answer, it's it's an open-ended question, mm -hmm. which I think is a particularly good kind of question. Um, one thing I definitely learned as a reporter was to never ask yes or no questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say what makes a story impactful, and this now feeds into the work that I do with my clients, it's mm -hmm. work at CBT Advisors that I've done for 17 years. CBT stands for Chemistry, Biology, Technology. I'm not mm -hmm. so egotistical that I'm naming my firm after myself <laughs> uh, because I want to signal to my clients that my practice is always data-driven, mm -hmm. content-focused, and really interested in what's happening at the ground level of their companies. Mm -hmm. And that usually, in, in my industry, that usually means molecules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 
as you mentioned, I have a biochemistry degree. I do usually start really at the ground level of, okay, what's the molecule and what's the mechanism of action and what's the differentiation from existing molecules mm -hmm. that are trying to address the same target or molecules or uh, therapeutic approaches that are addressing the same clinical challenge. I would say because I'm so bottom up, that bottom up is critical. That to, to tell a story, to tell an impactful story, to tell it in a way that gets you your, you know, that helps you achieve your goal, whether that's getting financing, getting mind share and buy-in, or whether it's simply to keep your project alive to live for another day, mm -hmm. that bottom-up is great. It's essential, but it's not sufficient. Mm -hmm. That the right story about any given advance or any given piece of technology also has to be top-down. And this is what I tell my clients is, you know, you're hiring me not only to give a bottom-up analysis of what you've got or to you start from the level of each atom in each molecule to show why what you have will be effective, mm -hmm. you're also hiring me so that I can sort of intersperse that with top-down elements of the story that will communicate to an investor, because that's usually the audience for the work that my firm is doing, mm -hmm that will communicate to the investor audience, okay, here's which playing field we're playing on. Here's, if they don't already know it, why it's an important playing field. Here's a playing field that you may not be that familiar with or an angle on the playing field that you may not be all that familiar with, but just suspend your disbelief for long enough for me to tell you about my technology. And I will be sure quickly to come back to this point about what kind of an impact this technology is going to have that other technologies or approaches will not have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you see the way I set that up. It's not like I shortchanged the science. It's that I framed it both before and after with points that should be in and of themselves compelling. It's a little bit like the hold that thought school of writing. Yeah. You know, that introduces a topic but doesn't really delve into the details until something else has come along. So if I tease them at the beginning saying, this is going to be great, it'll be a better solution than anything that's ever been on the market, hopefully that will keep their attention long enough that I can tell them what it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So great. Such great advice. And when I, you know, when I teach this, I talk about primacy and recency. You know, mm -hmm. in like, you know, in, in, in journalistic, you know, approach, it's, it's what's the lead, right? Don't bury right. the lead. You right. know, you've got to get that hook immediately. Um, and then, like you say, you can walk it back a little bit with some details, uh, but you need to come back at the end to really give it that, you know, that, that punch it up even, even further, because people are paying particular attention to the beginning and the end of a communication. Yes. I mean, at Business Week, I wrote for Business Week for a few months in the summer of one year mm -hmm. uh, before I started my career with nature. And they called it billboarding, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. billboarding, where you highlight some of the key points that you're going to be making, but don't go into the details right away. Right, right, right. And it's funny, too, because in, in, in talking with scientists who want to tell you a lot about what they know, uh, which which makes sense. Uh, of course, they're totally immersed in it, so it can be hard to identify those elements to surface. Um, but I say, look, you know, you're gonna, you're giving people the trailer, right? You're not telling yes. them the entire movie. Exactly. You want them to see the movie, <laughs> but if if you go into this all the twists and turns, they're just gonna lose interest. Never gonna do it. But you yeah. go with the trailer and think about it. Think about it that way. So really, really. So, so just so helpful. Let, well, me, let me give you a couple yeah, more. Yeah, go ahead. Now that you're on movies, I'm a big movie person. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a student of film. I'm also a great enjoyer of great film. Mm -hmm. I want my client's story the same way that a feature film director and producer want their movie. I want my story, my client's story, to resonate with what my audience already knows or thinks it knows. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always looking, as you said, you need a hook to get them in, but you also need a different kind of hook, which is the hook that says, hey, we're not going to try to tell you something that's totally outside of your world here. Mm -hmm. This is something that you too can relate to. Yep. Right. And I would say, you know, to make an analogy with the world we're living in in 2020, that honestly, 
every movie I've seen, and trust me, since the pandemic started, I've watched a lot more movies than usual. <laughs> yeah. Every movie I've seen has failed to capture the critical driving element of life during the pandemic, which mm -hmm. is that people can't talk face to face. They don't shake hands. They don't speak to each other physically when they're unmasked. All they're right. always on Zoom with each other. When the first movies start to hit the cinema or the home screen that actually pick up on the world that we live in now, there's going to be a huge resonance with them. Mm -hmm. Because the entire time we've been living in various states of lockdown due to the pandemic, the movie industry has been essentially not yet caught up to that. Right. So I'm just saying, again, back to the storytelling for scientists, engineers, and other technical people, mm -hmm. that it's one thing to talk to people about what you already know, but you've always got to ask yourself, how can I talk to them about things that they already know? Yeah, right, right. Great nugget. Yeah. And uh, of course, this leads to an obvious question, which are what are some of your favorite movies of all time? Yeah, I think I'm going to pass on that one. I'm not going to say the Andromeda strain, even though it has a happy <laughs> ending. Uh, okay. um, but I do want to come back to another one of these answers to your question. I wasn't really quite done answering your question. Go ahead. What is it makes that makes a story particularly compelling and mm -hmm. impactful? Right. I would say make it a bit quirky or counterintuitive mm -hmm. because if you do, you can, and if you do it right, you can make an audience feel smart for having heard it. Um, and, you know, for having caught on to the, to your little nugget of counterintuitivity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. make an open ended kind of promise. This is something that in my experience, it's why engineers usually do not make the best natural born pitch artists. Mm -hmm because in their training, they've been taught to button everything down, mm -hmm. to nail down every open question and to nail down all of the sorts of uh, valences that arise in developing a new product or technology. But actually entrepreneurs do the opposite. They, yes, they button a few things down, but they leave a lot of other things open. I mean, imagine Bryn and Page pitching Google to Kleiner Perkins, mm -hmm. I mean, there was already an early, early search engine, you know, Alta Vista and Yahoo existed when Brennan Page went to, mm -hmm. to John Thor. But imagine all the things you could do with Google. Well, I'm telling you that in 1997, you couldn't imagine that. Right. You couldn't. right. It was not possible. So in, in, when you look at it from that example, the pitch in order to be successful would have had to leave a lot of things open and allow the audience to dream. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's another tip then for people transitioning into or adding this skill to their other skills mm -hmm. is leave things open. Right, right, right. Because you want, I love that, you know, you want the audience, of course, to be engaged. And therefore, you want them thinking along with you. Uh, and you, or you want to at least trigger or ignite that thought process and yeah. i think that's sort of what you're and the unknown but giving them a little bit of information and then kind of leaving it open as you suggest that does kind of kick off that process perhaps well exactly and if you will i'm going to give you a another concrete example um of, of a story that i worked on that i think really fulfilled the demand to be mm -hmm. compelling and impactful and also another point to be properly timed Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Timing is vastly important. Right. Talk to seen, talk a little. I, mean, I want you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Go ahead. I have seen plenty of companies that had more than worthwhile value propositions, but mm -hmm. were just ahead of their time right. or otherwise poorly timed. Mm -hmm. So, cancer immunotherapy in 1996. I mean, a lot of the technology that the great uh, companies in immunotherapy, I'm talking about the development of checkpoint inhibitors and CAR T cells. Uh, a lot of the early technology was already established by the mid to late 1990s. Mm -hmm. And in fact, as a reporter, I got to meet some of the innovators in that area. But their companies went nowhere. And it really wasn't their fault mm -hmm. because other pieces, especially the clinical piece, the delivery piece, the hospitals piece, it just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, uh, even yesterday I was reading the newspaper, and there was a feature story about how COVID vaccines, the first wave of COVID vaccines, might require refrigeration to minus 80 degrees centigrade. <laughs> <laughs> and hospitals don't have it. Right, right. There aren't enough 80, minus 80 freezers in hospitals to allow for the cold chain to be maintained to the point where people could go to the hospital and get a vaccination. Yeah, right. So right. similarly, there was no infrastructure yep. in the 90s to yeah. do CAR T cells or what have you. Mm -hmm. Hospitals were absolutely underprepared for that. And so any entrepreneur who had that bright idea he probably, he or she would have become discouraged by 2012 when this stuff finally started to gel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here's an example of one thing that worked and where timing played a huge role. So my colleague and I drafted the business section for the IPO prospectus of CRISPR Therapeutics. Mm -hmm. And let me unpack that. What's a business section? It's the part of the IPO prospectus that describes the company and what it's doing and the market and why it's impactful. What's a prospectus? It's the document that the company has to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, that allows them to go public. So you got that a business section of prospectus. Do you think I need to explain that anymore? No, I think you've, you've explained it very clearly. Great. So companies that want to go public need to file prospectuses. And I often get asked to draft the business section. That's a lot of my current practice. Mm -hmm. So because of timing and connections and because of our expertise in this area my colleague and i were asked in around 2016 to get ready to help crispr therapeutics go public by drafting the business section now i, I just want to put out there that at the time there were already two companies that were further along in the ipo process two companies working on pretty much exactly the same technology that were already further along in the IPO process, mm -hmm. two, two CRISPR related or gene editing related biotechs. And those companies were called Editas and Intellia. Mm -hmm. When I look at the market caps, I looked up the market caps this morning before we, we started this session, Mark, mm -hmm. and the CRISPR therapeutics market cap was $5.8 billion. The Editas market cap was $1.9 billion. And the Intellia market cap was a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So Looking back four years to the time when these companies were going public and got public, in some way you could say CRISPR is the winner. Um, the big reason I would say for that is that they're a lot closer to proving clinical efficacy for their gene editing therapeutic mm -hmm. products than the other two companies are. And that would be a, a short answer for why. But I would say another reason why they were so successful is we had to be very, very careful in drafting that business section because they were, in a sense, going to be looked at as third to the party. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, there was going to be a real sort of big question mark hanging over them, like, why do we even need a third company? In right, right. And you're so arrogant to call yourself after the technology, CRISPR Therapeutics, mm -hmm. you know, like you're trying to occupy the whole damn field. Isn't that a bit much? Mm -hmm. So, and I, I can't resist mentioning Cerna Therapeutics also kind of rubbed me the wrong way. The, the, the company that you mentioned that had become a billion dollar exit for my mm -hmm. venture fund where I had done the investment was called Cerna, S-I-R-N-A. Mm -hmm. And it was using S-I-R-N-A, short interfering RNA, uh -huh. to do RNA therapeutics on cells and then eventually on people. And that company became part of Merck and then basically just was sold off to El Nylum. El Nylum now has multiple products on the market. It's a multi-billion dollar biotech company like CRISPR. Mm -hmm. Much further along, El Nylum now 18 years old with multiple products on the market. CRISPR, you know, six years old with one product approaching the market. Anyway, at the moment when CRISPR Therapeutics was about to go public, there weren't going to be therapeutic products on the market based on gene editing for a while. And so in some way, all three companies were research stage companies that were asking the market to trust them mm -hmm. to eventually develop therapeutics. CRISPR always had an advantage in that its, its technology had a strong intellectual property underpinning. And they've actually won almost all of the lawsuits that have been, gone on between them and Editas over primacy in the gene editing field based mm -hmm. on CRISPR.
Mm -hmm. But that's not even the most important thing. They also were winning. And this was obvious from the reading of our business section. Any investor who read the business section would have come away with the impression that CRISPR was further along because it had collaborations with pharmaceutical companies that were validating that CRISPR not only had good intellectual property, but it also had its head on straight in thinking about making products to treat patients out mm -hmm. of their technology. Right. So in some sense, the corporate deals, uh, Vertex Pharmaceuticals was a corporate partner of CRISPR even uh -huh. before the IPO. Uh -huh. The corporate deal served as a surrogate to signal to the market like, oh, this one, there's some real upside there. And don't get me wrong, Intellia had a deal with Novartis at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's not like Intellia was taken less seriously because they had a Novartis deal. But if you put the whole picture together, right. the intellectual property, the gravitas of what they were trying to do, the scientists on the team and the deal, CRISPR looked a little better. Mm -hmm. And then they also, I would have to add, did something after the IPO, which neither of the other companies really did, which is they pivoted. That is, they took the money they raised in the IPO, said, thank you very much. And they only raised 50 million. The other companies had raised more. Mm -hmm. They raised more money later, both through a deal with Vertex as well as through uh, a collaboration with Bayer, uh, as well as through another secondary offering, a different offering after the first initial public offering. They took all that money and instead of betting it all on the products that they had been describing in the IPO prospectus, mm -hmm. they said, hey, guess what? we're going to do cell therapy now and we're going to use our technology to edit the cells we're a car t cell therapy company now watch us edit cells in the best way possible mm -hmm. and in some way that sounds like a bait and switch but right. in another way it was perfect mm -hmm. because gene editing has taken a while to mm -hmm. progress to mm -hmm. full commercial stage that's really not yet quite there commercial stage yep. CRISPR has a product that should be commercial quite soon to treat hereditary blood disorders but it's progressed to the point where it's obvious that a use case for this gene editing technology lives inside the cell, the T cell. Mm -hmm. And that if you can edit T cells, you're going to have a disproportionate impact on a patient's response to cancer, potentially. Mm -hmm. And so CRISPR changed the battlefield. They changed the venue. They took the money and said, thank you very much. And they became a different kind of company. And in that way is that's how they've managed to grow this way and i think that they took advantage actually of being third to the ipo party <laughs> right right and then quickly pivoted uh -huh. very unusual but very successful right and it's all in my view it's all about storytelling they had to not say too much about their future plans mm -hmm. at the time of the ipo because mm -hmm. car t cells mm -hmm. kind of just twinkle in their eye mm -hmm. but already then i'm sure they knew that they were going to be changing things quickly after the IPO. And right. they basically allowed themselves the room in the document that we mm -hmm, drafted mm -hmm, to go ahead and do mm -hmm. that. That's fa really fascinating. Two things that kind of resonate particularly for me, Steve. One is sort of this, what I like to call guilt by association, but G-I-L-T, ah, um, you know, with, like Vertex, ver with Vertex, for example. Um, and the other is this, this, you know, learning from the other two IPOs. It's funny, just quick, quick anecdote from, from my side. You know, there are three sure. high schools in the county where I live, and um, they were all being redone, rehabbed, renovated, in some cases raised and rebuilt. Um, by the same architectural firm. So the county started with the one that was actually in the wealthiest, most affluent part of town. And they built it. Okay. Uh, then, you know, the second one, so it has a, it doesn't just have a pool, it has a natatorium, which, <laughs> you know, we didn't have in Framingham, Mass when I grew up. Oh. there um but you know because there's got to be a practice pool and then there's got to be the you know, whatever it is and so um then they built the second one which was in the kind of middle part of the county going from north to south uh and again all the same kind of features and then you know a few years later they got to the the one in the poorest part of the county and in talking to one of the architects who worked on all three, you know, she said, he goes, the first reaction, of course, particularly from the people who lived in the southernmost part of the county was, you know, this is just another example of the county putting these, you know, priorities of the wealthy ahead. Of sure. those, you know, but what this architect said to me is, you know what, that third high school 
is built so much better than the first or the second because <laughs> all the mistakes that were made in the first, some of them were corrected in the second, but not all. But by the time it came to the third one, it's, it's perfect. And yep. so the last uh, shall be first, I guess. Right. Well, uh, I, I realized that um, you had a couple more questions for me. Why don't we prioritize and take the questions that you think are most important? Sure. I want to get to, and this has been so valuable. I, you know, I, I know for, for the audience and, you know, and I knew it would be. Um, so I think I just want to jump to have you, you know, not that anyone can predict the future, but you're, you're coming to this with so many diverse perspectives and strands that can help kind of illuminate maybe what's going to be over the horizon. So, you know, obviously we're in a period of historic uncertainty and flux. And, you know, for, for many in my audience who are postdocs, um, you know, PhDs, grad students and universities, you know, we're seeing basically the university model kind of ripped apart in, in real time. And, um, you know, that has impacts, you know, across the spectrum. Um, but just thinking about, and you can cut into this any, any way you like, Steve, but kind of in this period, uh, this challenging period, you know, what sort of maybe opportunities do you see on the horizon? And, and maybe, you know, any kind of career advice for scientists and engineers who um, are looking at all this and any advice that you have for, for those who maybe are looking to start or shift careers in this time of, you know, turbulence? Great question. Uh, and I think I'm going to tackle that head on and at the same time weave in a couple of practical hints mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. contemplating this kind of career shift. Um, and that I think will, will be a good place to wrap. Um, so first and foremost, this is not necessarily a bad period for the future of biomedical innovation or mm -hmm. for the future of biotech venture capital. Honestly, those of us who are close to the investing engine that keeps biotech humming along all the way from seed stage and early stage venture funds all the way out to public investors, funds that invest in public biotech companies. There has never, and I repeat, never been a more fertile and productive period for all of those players and their portfolio companies than mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And we're not all quite sure exactly why that is. But one investor I know told me an interesting hypothesis this morning. Uh, I was talking to her, we're getting ready to do a fireside chat on a biotech conference that's been forced to become all virtual, mm -hmm. um, which means that she doesn't have to fly to Boston to do this with me. She's sitting in Munich. Mm -hmm. um, she is running a $400 million fund. She and three partners have done about 50 early to mid-stage biotech deals in the last 10 years. They've had some great exits, including one with a vaccine for infections like COVID. Mm -hmm. And what she told me this morning is that COVID has opened up new possibilities for life science, VC investing, and for entrepreneurship. And I said, oh, come on. I mean, you're sitting there in Germany. Isn't there a kind of historical resistance to genetic engineering in Germany? Right, I remember right. when I was right. living there, right. writing stories about public protests, about insulin manufacturing facilities that were going to be using genetic engineering. Um, that was around 1988. Mm -hmm. And what she said was, yeah, she laughed. She said, actually, the public is catching on to the fact that the virus is doing genetic engineering on <laughs> them. <laughs> That's so true. And that they had best come up with some kind of a response to that and that they weren't going to be able to do it all on their own. What mm -hmm. better way than by supporting and investing in the biotech industry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so her view is there's going to be plenty of demand for the talent coming up from universities and there are going to be plenty of jobs for those people mm -hmm. uh, because there's so much capital. Um, I would also want to say that the... Um, that I remember from the 2008, 2009 financial crisis that it felt like the world froze and it felt like people who were in school were best off staying in school mm -hmm. and that people who are already in the investing world sometimes wish they were in school. And mm -hmm. a lot of investment funds went belly up between 2009 and 2013 or so. There was really a great winnowing of the pool of prior successful venture funds. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would have to say right now, I don't necessarily think that it's 
better to just stay in school and wait this out. It feels to me, and this is just my personal opinion, mm -hmm. that the life sciences ecosystem, because of all this money, but also because of the many advances that new therapies have made in treating really challenging clinical problems like cancer, um, I would say that the ecosystem of life sciences is pretty disconnected from the wider economy right now. Mm -hmm. And there might be underemployment in the broader economy, but there is a real shortage of talent in the biotech industry. It's hard to start new biotechs because it's hard to recruit the teams because mm -hmm. there just aren't enough experienced, talented people, and therefore less experienced people who are nonetheless properly trained and talented, I would say they're going to have a, a good opportunity to jump in. Um, and now to, to wrap it up, I think I wanted to offer a couple of practical hints, if I may. Perfect. So one thing I know that you were thinking about when you set up this interview with me is techniques and tools. And I did want to offer one shortcut, if I may. Yes. Uh, it's not exactly learn how to write, although that's a good piece of <laughs> advice. It's right. not exactly a shortcut. Uh -huh. Uh, but one shortcut is Edward Tufte, T-U-F-T-E. If you go to his website, edwardtufte.com, this guy is the preeminent expert on the visualization of data. Mm -hmm. And he's published several books. I have them on my shelf. I refer to them frequently. I've read them cover to cover. Tufte is the master at explaining why data is presented badly. Mm-hmm and how it can be presented better. Uh, and I would just say, take it from there. Go look him up. Go get one of his books out of the library or order one on his website. There's a package deal that's cheaper if you buy them by the bunch um, because he's written about five of them by now. I think mm -hmm. there's a special deal if you buy all five. Uh, he does seminars. He comes to Boston a couple times a year, at least pre-pandemic. He would come mm -hmm. a couple times a year. I've gone three times. Mm -hmm. I've gone myself and then I've gone with associates in my firm because there's nobody better to explain the intricacies of why most graphics don't actually do what their designers want them to do and how to do it better. And that's a real shortcut. I mean, it'll help in a scientific career, but it will also fast track you to the kinds of presentations, impactful mm -hmm. presentations mm -hmm. you would have to make in the business world if you want to convince anybody to put money behind your idea. Right. Fantastic. Fantastic. So that's one, one quickie. I, I mean, I always have a list of books and other sort of tools that people can use. And maybe we can have you put them in the bio that you put up for me in, right. on your website. Right. So we don't for have sure. to about them here, but people can just look them up. Absolutely. We'll include the links in the show notes to this episode of the podcast. Um, Steve, this has been just so compelling, impactful. It's been funny, entertaining, and I know it's been educational. And I think in, uh, in essence, it's been really hopeful. Um, during this difficult time. So thank you for bringing your unique perspectives and insights to the show and to our listeners. Uh, it's a pleasure, Mark. Thank you for having me. And listeners, thank you so much for being with us on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you will be back, back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world.